so um i don't i don't think anything i'm going to say today will um change the basic message of the story of good samaritan and i really hope it won't overturn your view of bible of the bible or god um I'm going to affirm that the parable really is about Jesus's number one commandment to love God and love our neighbor. Um, and that it, or is that two commandments? Um, and that it really is about doing good to all, um, being kind to strangers. And it is about the fact that we should expect to be surprised by who has the capacity to do good. Even a Samaritan could be good. Oh, uh, in my youth, um, this parable was retold as the good punk rocker because punk rockers were like well they could never be good um and nowadays i suppose we might retell it as um the good donald trump supporter perhaps you know or the good anti-vaxxer i'll let you fill in your own blanks but let's let's begin the lawyer asks a question well um i've just uh i've just um done this by this uh, course okay so what i've read is there's a, there's a I learned is that there's a practice of reading the scriptures that jesus that was used in jesus time and is still used by jews today it's a very kind of traditional common rabbinical way of looking at the scriptures and it's called um hevruta uh, there you go uh, if you want to know what it looks like hevruta um and we have written records of it from soon after Jesus's time um, in, um, in about 100 years after. And, um, and I found it really helpful. And it involves two or more people just going slowly, verse by verse, word by word, through the text and asking questions, wondering aloud, noticing and, and pointing things out and looking for connections and resonances elsewhere. And, uh, and you don't answer all the questions, and well, certainly not to begin with, you just kind of hold the questions, okay? Um, and I'm not going to do it to the whole passage, don't worry, uh, you know, for those of you who think, oh, what? Okay, but just an example. If I was doing a hevruta on this passage, I'd say, oh, the lawyer asks Jesus a question. So it was a lawyer, was it? Uh, well, what's, what sort of lawyer? You know, is it, uh, is it a family lawyer or a religious lawyer? What? A lawyer okay and and is it common for lawyers to ask rabbi questions is that is that a normal thing is there anyone else in the bible that it says about lawyers questioning jesus or lawyers doing things and i wonder i wonder what their angle is you know is this lawyer being paid by someone else to come to to jesus and ask this question did the lawyer come up with this question themselves and did the lawyer um or is it the lawyer personally interested that in, in the answer, is they really interested? And as you hold all these questions, so that's what Hevruta is about. And as you hold all these questions, um, then later you kind of look for answers and see how they, how they add up, okay? And I mention this because, you'll see, this conversation happens between Jesus and the lawyer, and the lawyer says, what's the greatest commandment? which we actually know was quite a common question at the time. We have other people's interpretations of the greatest commandment because there are 613 laws in the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, 613. And so in Jesus's time, people were looking for, well, you know, what's the most important one? Um, you know, how would you summarize the law? So we have conversations written between rabbis who are trying to summarize the law. So. We know that the lawyer's question is quite a common one, actually. And then Jesus says, well, well, what's your take? You know, lawyer, what do you think? And the lawyer puts together two really key texts for Jews. He takes Leviticus 19, which is the holiness code, OK, um, and uh, which is love your neighbor and Deuteronomy 6, which is the Shema, Shema, a Hebrew word meaning here. So Shema is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, heart, mind, and strength. And this and this, this Shema, okay, is what Jews say every morning when they wake up and every night when they go to bed. And they put it on their uh, heads in boxes. They put it on their arms. They write it on their doorposts. The Shema is the fundamental text. So the lawyer has taken these two texts and put them together. 
And then what the lawyer does is he does a chevruta on the passage. Because the lawyer says, yeah, I put these two together, but I wonder what the word neighbor means in this context. I a neighbor, where does that come from? Where else do we, you see? So the lawyer's doing chevruta, Jesus and the lawyer, I think are doing chevruta. And then Jesus tells the story about what he thinks the neighbor's about. And um, I want to think about some stories that you might know and how things come in groups of threes. So uh, Billy Goats Gruff, there were three, weren't they? And it was the last one that did something different. Um, Goldilocks and the three bears. And it's always the last bowl of porridge, chair, bed that something happens to. And there's even three sets of things in that story. Um, lots of things come in threes, especially when you're when you're speaking or in your stories. Or if I said uh, friends, Romans, you might say countrymen, if you knew the speech. Um, friends, Romans. Uh, what about in telling jokes? So an Englishman, an Irishman and a, well, is it Scots or Welsh? I don't know go into a pub and then immediately I'm arrested for racism. Um, so, uh, so, you know, things come in threes. That's what we're used to, isn't it? Patterns of threes. And the Jews of Jesus's day were just the same. They had patterns of threes in their dialect and in their stories. And it was a common group of three that starts with priests and Levites. But I'll explain that it doesn't quite go where you think it's going to go. So, um, in the um, just trying to work out what, which, which slide I'm going to do, which slide I'm going to do first. Yeah. So um, the people that were taken out of Egypt at Exodus were Israel, okay, and there were twelve tribes of Israel. Got that? Okay. And then, um, and then the twelve tribes were given land to live in, except for the Levites. They were given no land at all, okay? So the Levites were called to be God's representatives, and they were to scatter and live amongst the other 12 tribes, kind of spreading the word of God and teaching people um, throughout, throughout Israel. So the Levites had no land, and they were there. But within the Levites, okay, uh, so within the Levite circle, you would then also get the descendants of Aaron. Remember Moses, his brother Aaron, who did the speaking for him, who, who wore the special breastplate and went into the, the Holy of Holies, who was the priest. So, so you have the descendants of Aaron who are priests, who were also scattered throughout the land. So you have priests, you have Levites, and you have Israelites, okay? So that's what they're expecting in the story. A priest goes along, a Levite goes along, the last person's going to be an Israelite and they're going to do something different. But Jesus turns the story on its head. It's not what I expected. Hold on a minute. It's, um, it's, it's uh, a Samaritan. Um, so I just want a little aside, because sometimes people think that the priest and the Levite don't go to the beaten up person because they don't want to become impure. If, if the man had died, we all know that touching a dead body in Jewish um, law, that would, one of the 613 laws, that would make you impure. So some people say the priest and the Levite were keeping themselves pure. That's why they didn't do it. I don't think that's part of the original intention. Um, it, it may be helpful to some in the story and it may have been helpful in the past, but I don't think that's what Jesus meant. And I'll say why for a couple of reasons. The first is, the priests and the Levites had to go up. They were scattered throughout Israel and they had to go up every year to do two weeks service up in the temple in Jerusalem. You may remember John the Baptist's father, uh, Zechariah, was doing such service in the temple when he had his vision um, about John the Baptist. And, um, and if you were in the temple, if you're in the Holy of Holies, in the presence of God, you needed to be very pure because we know that God struck down people who touched the Ark of the Covenant. We know that God was immensely powerful and you'd need to be really pure and have done, be really careful before you go into the temple. So the priest and the Levite on their way up to Jerusalem would have been keeping themselves very pure and making sure they were keeping every, every jot and tittle of the law. 
But on the way home, they were just going back to their own communities and their own neighborhoods, and they wouldn't have been so worried about keeping pure. But the second reason I think it's not about, about them doing that is because actually in Leviticus 19, that holiness code that I talked about, it is strictly, um, it, it's, it's a duty of anybody to bury somebody who doesn't have anybody to bury them. So if, if your family, if you die, your family bury you, but actually if there's nobody to bury, bury you, the priests and the Levites, it's their duty under the law to bury somebody. So they should have gone over and checked because actually, if he had no one to bury him, this person needed them to do it. So that would have been keeping the law. So I don't think it's about that in, in the original intention. But, um, but going back to the story, two people who should have stopped and helped didn't, and now a Samaritan does help. That's, that's what we know, isn't it? So the next question, of course, is, um, well, well, who are the Samaritans? You know, who are the, why is Jesus telling this story about the Samaritans? So I've got another slide for you. You're very exciting. Um, so um, the Samaritans were a group of Jews who were not taken into exile um, in Babylon. So, so over, you know, between 500 and 700 BC, the Northern Kingdom, of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, which both taken away into Assyria and Babylon, but not, but not um, the Samaritans. They are, uh, they live, they are the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, which is the descendants of, of Joseph. And, um, and they live in Samaria, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they stay there. They don't get taken away for whatever reason. And I guess if you were the Jews who were taken into exile, you might get a bit resentful of the fact that these others didn't get to leave their homes. And, and while they were away for 100 years in Babylon and Assyria, the Samaritans developed their own scriptures. They had the Pentateuch, the Torah, but they had different writings. They, weren't as, uh, they, they didn't have all the writings that the other Israelites did. They had their own holy place. They didn't have Jerusalem. They had Mount Gerizim. And they had their own set of... Um, priests. And by 500 years later, um, the Jews and the Samaritans, although they live in the same place, um, they are really, they are really at odds with each other. They are, um, they are distrusted, disliked, bad-mouthed. Um, there are rumors and things about what they do. You know, the Samaritans, oh, they are terrible. They did this, they did this. The Samaritans were supposed to have desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, sent spies down to Jerusalem and then de defiled the temple. What a horrible thing for the Samaritans to do. Um, of course, that's what the Bible says about the Samaritans. What do the Samaritans say about the Jews? What, what's their side of the story? Well, just before this chapter of the Good Samaritan, just before the conversation with the lawyer, Jesus has been traveling about through Samaria. And, do you know, he gets to a Samaritan town and the, and the Samaritans go, Jews, get lost. We don't want you around here. Um, and they can't even show basic hospitality, you know. And so uh, and so James and John, they're so cross. They say, oh, Jesus, can we call down fire on them? Can we call down fire and destroy them? Just like happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jesus says, no, no, sons of thunder, calm down. But you see, Sodom and Gomorrah's sin was being inhospitable. If you remember the story, they didn't welcome in the visitors. They left them out in the market square overnight. They didn't offer them food and shelter. So right after the Samaritans have turned Jesus away and were inhospitable, okay, Jesus tells a story where the Samaritan is hospitable. Well, the Samaritan is the one who is the good. So everyone would have been wanting to kind of go, oh, Samaritans, they're rubbish. And, they're, and look, they just rejected us. And Jesus tells a story on its heads going, wait a minute. And what I found really amazing in the study day, um, what, what really kind of shook me, was that Jesus tells the story and he quotes word for word almost the, the passage in Book of Chronicles that Jean read 
uh, so beautifully for us. Um, because at that time, when the kingdom was split between the north and the south, oh, I haven't got a slide for this, um, a northern raiding party in, um, from Israel came down and stole some people from Judah, some fellow Jews, and took them back as prisoners to make them slaves. And, and, and what happened was the people of Samaria, the people, the Samaritans, said, no, this isn't right. These are our fellow Jews. Yeah. And they said, uh, and they said this, that um, they gave up the prisoners and plunder and they took the prisoners and they clothed them who were naked. They gave them clothes and sandals. They gave them drink, wine and healing balm, oil. And they put them on donkeys and they returned to Samaria. And I find that just amazing. Jesus is reminding his hearers that it's the Samaritans who were kind to them once. And now it's their turn to be kind back. Jesus says these, these people who in your mind are bad and never can be good and not worth bothering with. These are the ones who once rescued you. And Jesus leaves it there. He just says, go and do likewise. And I sometimes wish that I could be like Jesus um, in, in that and not have to explain sermons, you know, because so often you, you tell a story and then you say, now this is what this means. Or, you know, in our situation today, it means this. But Jesus was such a genius. He was so God at telling stories and human psychology that he knew how to get people to just think about it and work it out and make a change in their life. Um, but I'm, I'm not Jesus. So, um, so I'll just finish by unpacking these angles on the story, and it's very short. The thing about the Samaritans is that they were close to the Jews. They lived amongst the Jews. They lived together, these people. This isn't Jesus, Jesus saying, oh, you've got to love the Roman Empire, or you've got to love a place called Britain that you've never heard about. Jesus is saying, these are the people who live among you, who you deal with, talk to, see every day. They are friends and enemies. As young people would say, they are frenemies. Um, but it's like the division in Northern Ireland, which I'm not gonna say is about religion because it's not, but it is two groups of opposing people who live cheek by jowl um, together in the community. It is Palestinian and Israeli today who live in the same community, but 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 cannot see good in each other. And um, and though, but that's putting it a bit further away from us, isn't it? If I say Northern Ireland or I say or if I say Israel. And what about people in our communities? You know, what brings it home? These are people we see of as enemies, actually. You know, these are people who we who we see every day, who we rub up against, but we just don't like them. They irritate us. They annoy us. They're stupid. They're, they're jerks. They're the ones we insult, but usually not to their face. See, I think this parable says, asks us not who is my neighbor, but, but who is the Samaritan in my life? And um, and if you if you're living with somebody at the moment, if you're in sharing a house, uh, they probably will be able to tell you who the Samaritan is in your life, because they'll be the person that you moan about. And if you're having a, ba a bad day, they're the person you blame. You know, if you're on your own, it may be harder to identify who's the Samaritan in my life. Perhaps if you're suddenly overcome with emotion, well, maybe look for the trigger and that might be a clue. But Jesus says, yes, it's them. It's them, that person. And that person may be the only person who can bring you peace. And now you know who they are. Is your job? No, it's your command to make the first step to reconciliation, to choose to love them, to choose to be the good Samaritan. <laughs>